biggest thing that I've learned is that um, like the only person that I need to compare myself to is myself. We closed out that job, got paid, and a couple days later, through nice job, we get a five-star raving review. For me, it's like, I know that it might not be realistic to never get a one-star review, but our goal is kind of like to never get a one-star review about the same thing more than once. If I get a negative review, my first response is call the customer, offer the solution, um, and then if that customer is still like... Be humble enough to know that like you can't do everything perfect on your own. Welcome to the Built By Me podcast. On today's episode, we're talking customer service. Joining us is Dallin from Flamingo Pools out of Arizona, as well as Brandon from Seal Pro Painting out of Florida. On today's episode, we're talking all about customer service. Both Dallin and Brandon have a wealth of knowledge in their respective industries. We talk about how to deal with customers, maintaining top quality service, as well as how to react to both positive and negative reviews. Without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Hello, and welcome to the Built by Me podcast. I'm Taina. I'm Mo. Today, we're talking all about customer service reviews in the home service industry. We have two very special guests, both in home services, but in slightly different categories. I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Tell us about yourselves. I'll start us off. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. My name is Dallin Huso. Uh, happy to be here. I own a swimming pool uh, maintenance and repair company. Not sure how much yeah, detail you want us to go into, but we're located in, uh, in Gilbert, Arizona and been in business a little over five years now. I'm Brandon Sewell. I'm the owner of Seal Pro Painting and also uh, Seal Pro Seal and Wash um, now, recently acquired that. And then um, I'm also the host of the Off the Ladder podcast, and I've been in business now for going on eight years, uh, servicing all of Brevard County um, and East Orlando here in Central Florida. Can you tell me a bit more about your businesses, how you got started, how things have been going? Yeah, uh, so I got started back in 2017. Um, I got into the painting industry back in 2016. Um, I was, I was up in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was working for a painting company there, uh, doing sales, marketing, and, um, even at one point did some of their admin. Um, and then I came down to Florida and started my own location with them. So it was like the same brand, uh, just, I owned this location and then, um, negotiated out of that partnership in 2020 and started seal pro painting, um, which I am a hundred percent owner of. Um, uh, and yeah, um, you know, early on business was definitely challenging, still face challenges, you know, but you learn from them. Um, I've gone from where I ran a like subcontractor model business to a kind of like a hybrid model. Um, at one point had, you know, 12, um, employees. Um, and then I've right now I'm, I'm at six employees and, um, you know, just been through all kinds of ups and downs and changes along the way, but yeah, just thankful to be in business still and, um, enjoying our share of success. Amazing. That's cool. How about you, Don? Yeah. So I, um, a year or two after high school had kind of bounced around from a couple of jobs. I had no really like set in stone plans or intentions of like ever owning a business. Um, but my dad actually recommended that I read the book, rich dad, poor dad, um, which I know is a lot of like starting points for a lot of entrepreneurs. And so that really just kind of like shifted my mindset in terms of what was possible and what I could do with my life. Um, and so at the time I was actually working for, for a pool company, um, cleaning pools. And I knew obviously from that and just from growing up in Arizona my whole life that it's really hot here and that there's, you know, plenty of pools. So I figured there'd be a lot of work, um, to go around. So yeah, I bought a pole and a net and a brush and just started knocking doors, trying to get clients. And that was, yeah, a little over five years ago now. That's amazing. So, so both of you guys kind of started within the actual industry and then kind of moved out, moved out, out of it. So what, what, what would you, what would you say, What's kind of sort of the biggest, you know, learning maybe that you learned about yourself or that business throughout that time? Maybe we'll start with you, Padalan. Yeah, so I think it's really important to like put yourself in other people's shoes. Um, and so like being a technician and then now being like the business owner and having technicians, I think it's important to like have that perspective of what it's like 
um, to be a technician because, you know, it's not the most fun job in the world for anyone. And so just having a little bit of grace for them and knowing what they're going through, I think is super important as you're trying to to grow a business and, and hire people to do a job that, you know, ultimately you don't want to do anymore. Yeah, I, I could totally I could totally relate to that. Um, how about you, Brandon? What would you say was the biggest thing that you've learned about yourself throughout that throughout that, you know, from when, when you started to now? Um, so the biggest thing that I've learned is that, um, like the only person that I need to compare myself to is myself, um, and not get caught up in like, um, where I might see other people, other entrepreneurs are, um, because the reality is, is, um, you know, everybody out there is putting out like, okay, here's what my best is. Um, and the reality is I think every entrepreneur goes through, you know, those high highs and those low lows. And so I've just, um, in, in my journey from, I would say, especially from 2022 to now has just been really learning to enjoy the process of being a business owner and enjoying even the, the hard times and the struggles, because, you know, before I think I used to look at those hard times and think like, oh, wow. I'm failing or this is the end of my entrepreneurial journey and maybe I'm not going to make it um, to where now um, because I've gone through so much and made it through. Now I just look at those and I'm like, okay, what am I supposed to learn in this season and where is it going to, how is it going to take me to the next level? Um, and really just looking at, you know, and enjoying the process um, that involves those highs and lows instead of, because I think it's really easy to, um, you know, we kind of briefly talked about this before the show is like the anxiety and like the the mental pressure of being a business owner. It's easy in those low times to kind of get like that um, doom and gloom um, mindset. Um, and you really have to shift that and really just look at it as like, okay, this is just part of the process. And what am I going to learn in this season and learn and grow from it? Again, thank you guys for being on, on the show today. We are talking all about customer service today. So we're super excited to kind of have you guys both, both coming with different backgrounds, different industries. Um, let's kind of start with, let's kind of start the conversation. I, I, I'm curious to know what steps do you guys take in your business to ensure that every interaction you have with your customers leaves them feeling satisfied and valued? It will start with you, Brandon. Um, so for me, I think it really starts with like, um, your foundations as a business owner. So having a really good, um, culture, understanding like your mission, your core values as a business, and then handing those down and really, um, helping your team to catch those, uh, core values and that mission as a business. Um, because I think when you hire people and you, you kind of create this expectation from like even the point of onboarding that this is who we are, this is how we do things, and this is why we do it, um, then your team is going to kind of, um, they're, they're going, that's going to like pour out of them in the experience um, they create for your customers. So our my team is very clear about you know, who we are as a company and why we do what we do. And I look for that too in my team. Like when we're onboarding and we're interviewing and we're asking questions, we're looking for things in their character and their personality um, that are going to help us to deliver um, the customer service experience that we do. One of my best um, team members, one of the things that I loved when he, when I interviewed him is he said, you know, at the end of the day, um, you're hiring me to do a job, but it's not just your company's name that is on that job. He's like, my name is on that job. And he said, you know, when I go and I serve your customers, our customers, um, it's not you um, who is the only one they're going to see like out at the grocery store or out at the park or doing something in the community. He said, it's going to be me. He's like, I'm the one who worked on their home. So I have to be able to live with the fact that, um, you know, whether I did treated that customer <clears throat> right and did good work, he's like, because if I don't, I'm the one who has to face them in the community and know that was my work. And so, um, look, I look for that in, 
my employees for them to like take ownership and understand that 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 job is it's not just about don't just do it for me don't just do it you know uh for seal pro painting but do it for yourself because you want to represent yourself well and that's really served um served us well in and how our customers receive that experience that we're looking to give them yeah hiring the right person or the right people on your team really makes a difference we talked about that in another um, episode with joshua brown where he was saying that you hire you know uh, personality and um, hire people that you want to go out to breakfast with because um, that's ultimately when you're in the home service industry they're the ones who are going to be speaking to your customers and i love how you put that sense of ownership on them as well because it's not just you and your name your business it's also them and your team members because they're the ones working on the actual service so i love that cool cool yeah so kind of along those same lines i think um one thing that we do is recognizing that there sometimes we think about customer service and we think just about like the technicians and their you know conversation and communication and experience with the customers but like there's so much more than that it's there we don't think about like that first initial time they call us, like who are they speaking to? How are they being spoken to? What does the quoting process and the estimate and sales process look like? What's like the follow up um, after the job is done? And so for us, it's been about like building a team and kind of putting different people in different positions where they can really just focus on, you know, whether that's that quoting and that salesperson or whether it's like our customer service representative who's taking all the inbound leads or someone who's following up with people. And that way people can really succeed at what they're doing when they just have one main goal and one main focus and they're not like worried about 10 different things at, at the same time. So um, just as early as I was able to, I invested into those people and into kind of growing and, and expanding the team so that we could really offer customer service, not only with our technicians, which is obviously like such a huge part of it and doing, you know, what Brandon said, but like the other aspects as well. So, and, and that's not just not just the time, but putting money into those people too, and making sure you're hiring high quality people. I, I made the mistake at one point during the business to uh, to have a virtual assistant answer our phones and, and nothing wrong with virtual assistants. I have overseas people that do stuff for me right now as well. But at, at the time I picked this person because they were the cheapest um, and that was kind of the quality of service I got from them. And it just wasn't up to the standard of what I wanted for our customers. And so I've then, you know, gone back and spent, you know, more than double, probably close to triple than what I was, you know, spending at, at one point and just investing into really good people that can offer that quality service for our customers through every aspect of their journey and experience through our company. Good point. I mean, I know I know there's a lot of times when when, when you're getting a quote, even even when you're calling somebody to actually get a quote for yeah. for a job, if 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 that interaction is horrible or sucks, right. like you're instantly going to be like I got a bad vibe from this company. I'm not going to go with them. You know what I mean? Just from that point. So you haven't even done the job. You haven't even showed them like, here's what we can do for you. Here's what we can, you know, here's, here's what we've done in the past or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really good point. Cause is you're right. It, 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 there is the importance kind of goes across the entire stage of that, yeah. of that process when you're dealing with the customer. Right. So you have to make sure you, you're thinking about all those instances and not just, you know, you know, doing a really good job at the end. Um, but it starts even at the beginning. That's a really right. good point. Yeah. The customer experience really starts when they're looking for something. So if I'm mm -hmm. looking for a pool cleaner, I'm looking for a painter. Like, And then you go on there, you see the reviews, you see your website. Is there help on your website? How can I contact you? And that's when the customer experience really starts, not necessarily when you're actually doing the service. Right. Um, so how have you guys made sure that that has been seamless across the board from from the moment that you know the customer has an idea or like knows that they need your service? Della, maybe you can start. Yeah. So, sorry, you, you, it kind of cut out for a second. There, we're saying, how can you repeat the question again? Yeah, of course. Like, how do you ensure that the whole customer experience is seamless from the moment that they decide that they want a pool cleaner? Yeah. So, and it's it's tricky for sure, but we have to make sure that like our team all understands not only what their roles are, but what everyone else's roles are. And because it's one thing to like understand what you're supposed to do, but when you don't know that someone else is supposed to be doing something, you might, you know, have good intentions, but you might try to do something that's out of your role when someone else was taking care of that. And then that causes miscommunication. So um, we try to meet, you know, as often as, as needed as a team to kind of really like, you know, hone into to what that looks like and what we're supposed to do. And I'm always open to like, do we need to make changes? Do we need to do anything to make this more seamless? So uh, I try not to like, you know, be set in my ways on certain things because they're the ones that are doing it. So understanding like, what makes most sense for them and how they feel like 
those conversations and, and processes should flow best. And then just setting up like KPIs and numbers to track around that. Like what do our numbers look like in terms of like answering the calls or getting back to people and reviews and stuff like that. And those numbers kind of really help us understand if that process is really seamless or not on our end. Yeah, I would say like what I always try to do as a business owner is like put myself into my customer's shoes and really think about what their experience is going to be. I also try to think of experiences that I've had, like if I'm looking for a service for my home and I think, oh, wow, that was like, that was a pain point for me um, connecting with this business, whether it was like they didn't answer their phone or maybe I left a message or request and they didn't follow up with me um, in a uh, timely manner. Um, or maybe they didn't have, um, you know, technology that helped um, my interaction with them to be more efficient and seamless and um, communication maybe wasn't there. So I, I really try to um, put myself in the position of the consumer and think, how can I create a, a system from the first phone call to the completed job that is, um, you know, just kind of seamless and I do have to, uh, you know, shamelessly plug Jobber um, because we use Jobber as our CRM. And um, I think whether you're using Jobber or something else, having something in place that's going to help facilitate um, that customer experience um, and just that that flow um, from them coming in as a as a lead. Um, through your entire customer journey to job completion and and helping to facilitate that journey in a in a seamless way and Jobber helps us to accomplish that and um, I, I do uh, just as you guys were talking before I wanted to throw this in there like when you're creating a a great customer experience I think you have to think about opportunity costs because. Um, you know, there's things that could save you money that could be cheaper. Um, there could be, you know, you could have a, a, you know, customer who complains about something and you really have to think like, what is this going to cost me if I respond in this way? And sometimes, um, you know, you, you know, one um, way of looking at it could be like, oh, well, I saved money, you know, in the short term, but what did it cost you in the long term by not having, you know, uh, this you know, process in place for your customers. And, um, you know, I, I think that unfortunately we can get short sighted as uh, business owners and not see the importance of, um, you know, some of these key things in your business and the customer experience. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a good point. Yeah, it's a really good point. Cause I think, you know, at the end of the day, like within, within, within the home service industry, like, you know, you're going to, you're going to get into a situation, negative reviews are going to arise, right? It's going to happen. Um, and how you address those is going to be key, right? So I want to switch gears. I want to talk a little bit about that because I want to I say like, what, what, if, what, you know, what would you guys say? Like, how do you handle negative reviews today? You know, what strategies have you maybe implemented to, to, to address some of these, these concerns that are, you know, that are brought up by your customer, whether it's a bad job in general or a bad employee or things of that nature. I was just going to say this might be controversial, but I think that you don't have to get bad reviews. Like, yes, they could happen, but I don't think you have to. I think so. Like for me as a business owner, we just recently I'll share this example. We had a project and I give my lead guys like the autonomy to be able to make decisions. And what I say is I I don't um, delegate tasks, I delegate authority. And so what I mean by that is I give them the authority to make decisions based, like I've hired you um, for your expertise and I trust that you have the skill and the ability to um, do what it takes to do this role and all of your, um, all, all the things that come with that. So when I send them out to a job, I'm putting my trust in them and I give them the authority to make decisions. Well, one of my guys, unfortunately, made a decision that he shouldn't have made. And the customer was very upset and had really kind of um, tarnished our trust with that customer. Now, customer reaches out to me. He's like super, uh, you know, aggravated, angry. 
Um, he even went as far to say that he wished he wouldn't have hired us, that he would have hired this other company that he was looking at. And um, I was like, okay, I'm going to be at your job tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. and we're going to address this. So as the owner, I showed up and I explained, okay, I'm, I really apologize. Like, you know, um, my employee should not have made this decision, but this is why he made that decision. He felt like it was the best thing to do. I understand you're upset. This is what we're going to do to fix it and make sure that you are happy. And then in the course of that job, we actually ended up spending like an extra, I don't know, maybe like five days at this customer's house. It was not a super profitable job. Um, but at the end of the day, it was funny. We closed out that job, got paid. And a couple of days later, through nice job, we get a five-star raving review um, from this customer. And he's like, you know, this company um, aims to please and please they did. I'm thrilled with my home. They did an amazing job. And me and my employee like looked at each other and were, were like, what? Like he was so mad. He was so angry. Um, we never would have expected a five-star review. But all that to say, I think um, you like what I understand as a business owner is I can, I chose to lose a little bit of money on that job. We did some extra things for free. Um, we threw in some, you know, stuff that wasn't expected um, just to kind of turn that situation around, you know, wow the customer again. And what I understand is like, yeah, I might have in the short term lost a little bit of money, but in the long term, I kept our great reputation and he is now going to continue to refer us or tell people how great of a company we are. And so now I'm thinking, okay, I don't, I don't know for sure, but maybe I lost, you know, 500 bucks here, but I gained thousands of dollars in the customers that I'm going to get because we maintained our great reputation. I love that. Actually, the whole the whole idea of don't wait for the negative review. That's really good. I think that's a. Yeah, go ahead. I, no, I was just going to say, be as a entrepreneur, have that ability to think outside of the moment. Right. Because in that moment, you could think like, no, we did fine. This was justified. Give me my money. I'm not losing money on this job. And it's like you're you're uh, looking at five hundred dollars versus like the potential for, you know, clients that are going to come along the road and see your excellent reputation and use you. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think you just have to ha have that long term vision for your company and, um, and realize how important your reputation is. Yeah. And that's a great example of a time where you could rectify the situation before it escalated to becoming a negative review and you were able to step in and switch that have you had an instance where it comes after where you weren't aware of you know that they were going to even leave a negative review and how you responded to that oh yeah for sure and i'll, I'll try to make this short so i'm not stealing <laughs> all the time but uh i so i had a customer this was probably last year or maybe a year the year before i had a customer we finished the job didn't hear anything from the customer to my knowledge the customer was like super happy um you know paid us there was no problems and then next thing you know i got this review on google and it was it, it's it had like super positive things to say but then she gave us a four star review and we have a five star rating so i was like what in the world i was like everything you said was positive why didn't you just give us that extra star and then um I called her and I was like, hey, I am so sorry. I had no idea that there was an issue. I saw everything in your review was positive, but you left us four stars. I was like, what did we do? What can I do to earn a five-star review from you? I want you to know that's like, that's our, our standard. And she was like, oh yeah, like, you know, you got some paint on the weather stripping to my door. I was like, I am buying you all new weather stripping. I will be there tomorrow. I'm replacing it all myself. And so I did. I went out and I actually had to special order this because her doors were so tall. Um, they don't sell it in like big box stores. So I had to special order it um, next day from Amazon Prime, um, got it in and went and redid all of her weather stripping around her doors and then she was like thank you so much and she changed her review to a five star <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's amazing 
love that. How about you, Don? Any 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 uh, pro tips? Yeah, so I'll say two things. One is kind of along the lines of like trying to avoid those reviews in the first place. Um, we have someone that will do like job follow ups with customers after we do a job because sometimes customers like don't communicate with us when something didn't go well, and so there's been multiple instances where we've probably saved ourselves from a bad review because on our end the job went perfectly. It looked like the customer was satisfied, but then we call and find out that there was like a couple things they weren't happy with and they just like didn't tell us about it. And so we'll do that to kind of like get ahead of it, go and fix whatever issues there were. And then that turns into a five-star review. Um, that being said though, like I've also been in situations where we do everything possible to make the customer happy and some people just don't want to be pleased. Um, and so we have received those, <laughs> those one-star reviews in the past, unfortunately, um, and I try not to get like, I, I used to let it bother me a lot when that happened. Um, but we try to look at it as just like a learning experience. Um, obviously like none of our technicians or none of our, you know, team members are intentionally trying to get a bad review because they don't want, you know, to lose their job or, or for the company to fail in any sort of way. So we know that there was some sort of miscommunication or misunderstanding somewhere. So, um, for me, it's like, I know that it might not be realistic to never get a one-star review, but our goal is kind of like to never get a one-star review about the same thing more than once. So when we fig when we have some issue arise and someone didn't understand something, or like I said, there was a miscommunication somewhere, we try to figure out, okay, why did this happen? How did it happen? What can we do to make sure that that particular thing never happens again? Um, I, it comes down to, I feel like our core values, one of our core values is excellence. And so, you know, we don't expect perfection from all our guys, but when we do make mistakes, we always do what we have to do to go back and fix that and make sure that we don't repeat that. I really like what you said about we try to make sure we don't get the same one-star review about the same thing over and yeah. over again. Because isn't that the definition of insanity is doing <laughs> the same thing over and over again and expecting different results? Yeah, for um, sure. So it's cool because you have to learn from it so it doesn't happen again. Because not saying that, you know, people are always going to be satisfied, but at the very least, you can make sure that your team learns from whatever whatever mistake might have happened. I did want to throw in there, we have um, we do have two locations. And so... Um, our location in Orlando, um, we have Orlando and then Brevard County. Um, our location in Orlando, we do have one one star review, and it was kind of a situation like uh, Dallin was saying: is that customer was impossible to please. It's like I felt like there was nothing we could do um, to make them happy, and so I think in those situations, it, you actually take it better because you realize like, okay, it's not a lack of effort on our end or a lack of want to, um, make it right. It's just, this customer is just impossible to please. And what made me feel even better at that time, I had an admin and she like researched this person and she was like, this person leaves tons of bad reviews everywhere. Like that was like their reputation on like Google. They had left like hundreds of negative reviews. And I think some people are just like that, you know? And, um, and that was for me, uh, it, what I will say is how you respond to those is important too, right? So don't just leave it blank or respond in a, in a defensive way. But what we did is we responded to that review and we put everything that we tried to do to resolve it and what the customer did to like turn down our solution um, and then opened it up and said, if there's anything we can do to make this right, just let us know. So then if a future customer that's looking through our reviews goes in and sees like, wow, they have, you know, 64 uh, five-star reviews and they have this one one-star, well, that's an anomaly. Um, and what did they say? And what was the owner's response? Did they get super defensive? Um, and did their defensive response look like they were justifying something that, you know, wasn't okay? Or were they apologetic and willing to write the problem, but that customer was just impossible, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, look, the reality is bad reviews will come, like, like you guys both said, right? Like, they're going to come and a lot of times good reviews come more often than bad reviews, which is, that means that that's a sign that you're doing a great job. But I did, I did, I did really like the, the point that, um, Dallin, that you mentioned about calling because sometimes people don't, are not, aren't that vocal, right? You, you could have, you could do a bad job and they, you know, they're not gonna, they're not the type to go and type a review, right? There's a lot of people that are just like, just, you know what I mean? I'm going to eat it and I'm going to move on. Yeah. And then, but that, that's also going to impact your business long term because then that customer is going to tell people, if they ever hear your business name, they're going to be like, mm, don't go with them, 
right? So that reputation is getting tarnished behind the scenes. It might not get being tarnished online, mm -hmm. but behind the scenes, you're missing out on referred business, right? Sure. So that's a really good point. We also really like, um, we always say to that businesses should respond to negative reviews. I wanted to ask you both, do you think that they should respond and rectify the situation online or offline? And what I mean by that is, do you think they should say, you know, thank, like I, we appreciate your feedback, um, like, we'll give you a call like you know and and try to solve this or do you think they should in the response to the review be like we tried to do this uh, we can do this for you um, or should it just be you know let's handle this you know on the phone um i i think it's both um i like to, i personally like to put what the solution is so that like i said if a customer goes and reads how we responded they can see through our response and our solution, what our character is, right? So I don't think anybody expects everybody to be perfect. Like that's impossible, right? We we're going to make mistakes. There's people that are going to be upset for something, but um, can we own it when we make those mistakes? And can we um, offer reasonable solutions uh, for the customers in those situations? And so I, th I think it's important to um, state those, but, um, but always follow that. I usually don't even, if I get a negative review, my first response is call the customer, offer the solution. Um, and then if that customer is still like unreasonable or they're not willing to like accept our solution, they're not willing to have any type of, um, you know, fix to the problem, then that's when I'm going to, I'm just going to make it clear through my response to that review, like we offered a solution and this customer wasn't willing to, to work with us, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, our, our, our process kind of along the same lines, our first thing we want to do is like jump on a call with that customer right away and see what we can do to, to figure out that situation and make it right. Uh, obviously we would hope that they would change that review to five stars after, after we change that situation, but we understand that not everyone's going to do that. So that's kind of where we'll go in and kind of document, you know, what we did to make it right. Um, and so that way that's visible to share, you know, our perspective as well. And I think that's important when you have prospective customers looking around. Um, cause I mean, putting myself in a customer's shoe, if I see one company that has like five star ratings, but they only have three reviews, but then I see another company that has, you know, 500 reviews and it's like a 4.9. And then I see that these, the only negative reviews, there was a response that seemed like well thought out and they tried to go um, and fix the situation. Like you said, Brandon, like, I don't think anyone expects anyone to be perfect. And so, and I wouldn't expect that when I'm, you know, hiring a co company to do something as well, but I would expect them to, you know, admit to their, their wrongs and try to do what they can do to fix those situations. So that's, that's what I'd be looking for as a customer as well. So we just try to do that um, on that yeah. side. We actually say that the best review or the best rating is 4.9 because you don't want to be too perfect because people are going to be suspicious. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Brandon, you got to have at least one. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go write you one, Brandon. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> don't take care of it for me. No, I, no but that's that's good. I've, uh, I've, I've definitely heard the um, uh, statistics on that or like the data that proves um, that I think uh, – do you, you guys know Sebastian? Sebastian, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I had Sebastian um, on my podcast. And that's one of the things that we talked about is just the data um, that that shows like people are more likely to go with um, a company that doesn't seem so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, which I'll have to really work on that. I'll have to tell my guys to go make a mistake today. <laughs> No, but I do like that you guys call right after because it, it does bring or give the customer an opportunity to change that review. And then it kind of like rectifies the situation on its own versus having to respond anyways. And then if they don't, then you can respond. So I like that both online and offline. I was going to say too, I think you have to consider like the type of business you are too. Um, so like uh, Dallin and I, we have kind of like opposite uh, uh, business in the sense of like our length of service. So he's doing probably, you know, he probably has a route for the day where he's doing serving multiple customers in a day and probably, you know, uh, many more during the week than we would ever service because our jobs typically take longer. So um, we're not going to have, like I, I have some friends who have uh, 
uh, service companies like window cleaning or pressure washing, like those things. And they have thousands of reviews and we don't have as many because our jobs take longer. So we're serving less people. But I think that also, um, it, it makes it harder, I think, for us to get those, um, or, or it's just like st statistics, right? So like, um, if you're serving, um, let's say like 30 to 40 clients per week, well, your uh, the possibility of you getting a low review is higher than me who's serving, you know, two to three clients per week. Um, so I think you have to take that into consideration as well. Um, but I think that's also why it's so important to not just focus on like, what is your rating, but how many reviews do you have? Kind of like Dallin said. So if you service 30 to 40 clients per week, um, but you, you have a thousand reviews, that's, that's great. And maybe you have a 4.9, but the, there's like an overwhelming majority of satisfied clients. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, Dallin, how many people or clients do you have approximately per week? And also, what are some key measures that your team takes to uphold those high standards if you have, you know, more than one person? Yeah, so we serve about 500 people on a weekly basis. Um, so yeah, like Brandon said, it's a totally different like spectrum of, of industries there. So we're, we're doing weekly service for these clients. So we're going week after week. Um, and it can be tricky because like there's sometimes there's things that are out of our control. We could do a perfect job, you know, cleaning a pool. We could inspect the equipment. Everything looks great, but it's middle of the summer. And the day after we leave, the pump just breaks down because it's an old pump. And then, you know, people go swimming and then now you've got, you know, algae in the pool. So there are situations where like the actual service side is out of our control. And so that's where customer service really comes comes in handy for us. And why I, you know, I keep talking about like we're always investing in our customer service and making sure that we're available for our customers because we want them to be able to call us. We want to be able to, you know, help them figure that situation out. Um, and that, and that we just focus on controlling what we can control. I think is a big thing for us because we can't always control, you know, like I said, a pump going out in the middle of the night, in between service visits in the middle of summer. Um, and so we just focus on like what can we control. And so that goes to our technicians as well. Um, and we're always talking about our core values. We're always talking about excellence. Um, and just communicating what our expectations are with our technicians um, and just setting standards. Like our guys know that if they miss something that they're going to have to go back and fix that. And so when they know that and they know that they're going to be held to that standard and they have a manager that's, you know, watching over them and what they're doing on a daily basis and the pictures of their pools and what, you know, what they're putting into the pools, they're going to spend two to three extra minutes per stop making sure they did everything because otherwise that's a 30 minute, you know, drive back to that pool later in the day to do it. And so they've, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of times you learn the hard way, um, but they've learned um, to really just take that time and do it right the first time so that we don't get those callbacks. What's the funniest thing that's happened in a callback? Like, have they said anything or like a customer story? Um, man, callbacks, callbacks. I don't know. I don't know what funny, but they, they can be frustrating because <laughs> We'll, we'll clean the pool spotless and then like this little leaf falls into the pool like 30 minutes after our visit and we're like, we clean the pool. We have the picture here. They're like, no, there's a sleep. It's like, well, that was after the visit. Um, I was trying to think of like another funny, just I guess not necessarily a callback, but like we did have a customer call us once um, freaking out that he said a bunch of baby birds fell into his pool um, that they were drowning. And it was super sad. I was like, I don't know what I can do about this because, you know, by the time I get to you, they'll they'll drown. But he was I, I knew him personally, but he was super insistent that I came over and checked it out. Um, and so I went over myself. It turns out it was a bunch of baby ducks just kind of swimming around the pool. Um, they cute. found their way into his backyard. So we got one of those like pool lounge chairs and put it on the step um, so they could finally, you know, use it as a ramp to get out. It's actually on our Instagram page as well. But yeah, that's, that's probably just like in general, the funniest kind of customer service experience that, that I've been a part of. That's so cute. I want to see that video. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, Brendan, so I, I want to ask you about, about, you know, obviously you, you do a lot less jobs. Like you, like you mentioned that com compared to, to Dallin. So how do you, how do you how do you ensure consistency and when it comes to quality right when it comes to like you know your guys on the job doing 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 like you know the best work possible and how do you how do you, how do you kind of deal with that um so i kind of take a different approach to this than i think um a lot of people would expect but um 
I'll kind of echo what I said earlier is it for me, it really comes down to uh, culture. Um, and, and what I explain to my guys when we have team meetings, I'll explain to them. And I explained to this to uh, I, when I earlier in the interview, when I was talking about the customer who we had an issue with, um, you know, my employee came back to me and he was like, man, I'm kind of like beating myself up. Um, kind of questioning like if I um, you know have what it takes to like lead this team and I I stopped him and I said no stop I was like you think back to all of the amazing feedback that we've gotten from customers and um, how many people have raved about um, the level of customer service that you offer I said every person is different in their expectations and sometimes we miss that. Sometimes we don't like understand like what's um, what that expectation was, but it's how we respond to that. What matter is what matters most. Right. So um, quality, I think, in painting is kind of subjective to us in a sense, because there's some things that we can do where like one customer is like ecstatic and happy about it. And then another customer can be like, why in the world would you do that that way? And so really what I explain to um, my guys is the goal is to give the customer what they are looking for. And every customer can be extremely different in their expectations. So your job as that lead painter is to find out what that customer's expectation is and then deliver on it. And so I think that there's, you know, some people would think, oh, well, you know, having like a standard way of doing everything. It's like, well, yeah, you could have that. But then what happens when your customer is not happy with the way you did that? And so at the end of the day, um, we just want to um, offer um, kind of like a tailored service for our customers, right? And really hear what's important to them. And make sure that we're listening to that because um, one thing that's important for, you know, customer Bob is not going to be the same as, you know, Mary or Susie. You know, everybody's a little bit different. So um, that's kind of our approach to it and just uh, treating every customer like family. Do you have any funny stories? Different, different customer types? I've got so many different. I mean, they're more like stories that make you just shake your head sometimes like in... <laughs> frustration <laughs> like i can't believe this customer is uh doing this right now like i've i've shown up to jobs where the customer is like complaining about a paint job and they're like i had this one guy who he literally had this big um like spotlight and he's mm. walking me through his house and like shining it on his walls and he's like and you see that right there i'm like are like Oh, I, I'm sorry, but I don't walk through houses with a spotlight, like <laughs> looking for these like little tiny imperfections that are <laughs> like the size that. of like, you know, it, it, it's, you know, things like that. Some people can be kind of um, outrageous in their um, in those in those ways. Um, we've also had being in Florida, we can have customers who are kind of uh, ridiculous on their expectations with like weather. So we've had, I, I had this guy mm -hmm. call me one time and we were doing an exterior job before his and his job was going to be delayed. And so, um, he calls me and he's like, when's my job going to start? And I was like, well, mm -hmm. sir, I was like, unfortunately it's raining. So, um, this other job has been delayed, which is going to delay your job. He's like, well, I was expecting my job to get started. And I I paused and I was driving. Like we live, it's in our town right here in Titusville. He he only like where I was driving was maybe five minutes away from his house. And I just said, I said, sir, I was like, it's raining right now. <laughs> I was like, so even if we had started your job, we wouldn't be able to start because it's raining. And he's mm -hmm. like, well, well, I understand, but I need this job done. And I was like, I understand. I was like, but it's raining. There's nothing I can do about that, you know? And um, so, yeah, sometimes people just, you know, we live in kind of a, uh, I think, a culture where, you know, it's like we have Amazon Prime and people yeah. want to be instantly gratified. 
And so um, even when it's, um, you know, situations that are out of our control, um, some people just don't seem to get that, which is kind of mind boggling to me. Um, you know, we just had a customer recently, kind of similar situation. We had we had a customer who, um, when we were doing their job, they asked us to do some additional work. And mm -hmm. our response is always like, oh, yeah, absolutely. This is we can take care of that. We want to just go ahead and take care of it while we're here. And that might cause that job to like take an extra day or something. But I was on the phone with this customer and, and they were super defensive that we were going to be delayed starting their job. And I said, sir, um, if we were doing your job and you wanted like some additional work done, would you want me to like be focused on everybody else? Or would you want me to give your job the attention that it deserves and tell you like, hey, while we're here, we'll get this taken care of for you or tell you like, hey, we'll be back in two months. Um, you know, for and it could be something pretty uh, small. And he was like, well, yeah, he's like, well, you know, I'm not mad. And I was like, well, you sounded pretty mad. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, no, no, I'm just trying to communicate. And, I, and it, so I think sometimes it's like putting things like that into perspective for people. But yeah, people can just be kind of unreasonable sometimes. Yeah, you gotta you gotta almost have like a layer of like thick skin to it, right? Or like being able to like deal with with different kind of personality types, right? Yeah, and not let it not let it kind of like you know not don't like not overreacting to certain situations, right? Because yeah, you're gonna you're gonna run into the all all different types of personalities and customer types. I yeah, for sure. You, I wanted to ask you both quickly how you think your perception or expectation of other people has changed from when you first started doing this job to now when you've, you know, dealt with a bunch of people on the field. Maybe Dolan, you can go first. Yeah, I mean, just being a business owner in general, you're just like sympathetic to, I guess, technicians as well, because, uh, but just businesses in general, like knowing that whoever's at the top and whoever's controlling the business, I think for the most part, they're doing their best. Um, and they don't, you can't always control everything that happens, um, especially when you have, you know, so many technicians working on so many jobs. And then usually those technicians are are trying to do their best as well. And so it just goes back to like what I said earlier is like trying to just communicate with them because that's what we don't like is when customers don't communicate what their issues are with us. And so usually I've, I've found that like, okay, well, I'm sure there was some sort of disconnect somewhere. So if I communicate that with the technician or with, you know, their customer service team, usually they'll kind of go ahead and fix that. So just not getting like super upset right away, but just kind of, you know, communicating the situation. Usually I find that that they're super appreciative of that, just like we are. And they'll go ahead and, and, you know, get that situation taken care of for us. But yeah, definitely sympathetic to uh, anyone that's out there running or trying to start a business because it's a, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of stress for sure. Um, so what I would say on top of that is um, I've really learned how important listening is. Um, and, and that kind of goes both ways with customers as well as employees. And I think I've found that a lot of times um, – a lot of, uh, you know, conflict or um, situations of people being upset can be easily resolved by listening. Um, because I think a lot of times people just want to be heard. Um, so it's, it's not so much um, the problem, it's being able to voice it, um, being able to express it, and then um, like, just having your response, being empathetic, and then you know, echoing back to that person that they have been heard. Um, so it's like, listen, respond and affirm that you've heard what they've said. And you're not trying to like, um, mark off or like pass off how they feel, but you're you're validating it. Um, and then responding in a in a way that is, you know, um, is good for that particular situation. Obviously, like every situation is different. And, um, but I think it's leading with listening, if that makes sense. And, um, and then just affirming that that person was heard. That can solve a lot of issues. After dealing with people all, all day, every day, because it does get tiring. And you I didn't say, say that. <laughs> no, but it seems like you guys are both like, you know, still willing and wanting to try to make a, the best experience for your customers every day. And, and yeah. throughout the years, that can get hard because, it, you know, five years in the industry when people are 
you're serving people that might not necessarily be happy um, and trying to make people happy day in and day out is is really tiring on your mental health. Um, but it seems like you both have a great outlook on it. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, people are people. And um, it's like, I'm a person too. And mm -hmm. um, so it's just always kind of, I try to keep that in perspective in all situations. Like I, I, I have to understand like, these aren't just transactions. These are people who have real lives, real feelings. They have real things going on in their lives. And sometimes even the way that people are responding is not out of like, I mean, of course, there is a root cause to like what they're saying or what they're expressing. But sometimes there's other things that are causing that to like come to the surface. You know, it mm -hmm. could be like a stressful day at work. It could be an argument they had with their spouse. Um, it could be another conflict. And it was just you just happened to be in the middle of that. Right. You were just the closest target to receive whatever conflict was coming your way from a customer or maybe even employee. And then it's just, um, I really, I learned from a leader in my life is that um, leading is about, um, you know, you, when you lead, you, you control the temperature of the situation with how you respond. So um, if you match their temperature, well, you're, you've, you're not leading anymore. But if you're able to come into a situation and you become that like, you know, you, you determine what the temperature of that conflict or, um, uh, situation is, then, then you, you have more control. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's been a valuable lesson for me to learn. Um, I've, I've even, I think <laughs> I have one employee, he's like kind of a hothead and, um, I've had him, you know, just get really heated and I just, I stay super calm and I'm just like, okay, you know, <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. You know, it's okay for you to feel that way right now, you know, and you just kind of like, and then he'll like, look at me like, why are you, why aren't you yelling back at me? Why aren't you getting upset with me? And it's like, you know, I don't have to go there. So, um, yeah, I think it's just understanding people are people. Interesting. Really cool. I want to switch gears. I want to talk about positive reviews, um, a little bit and Dallin, maybe you can help yeah. with this one. Um, obviously like online reviews, social media is becoming a big thing now, especially in the home services space, but how do you leverage positive feedback in general, right? Like how do you, how do you leverage that to your brand's reputation? You know, do you have, do you have anything that you've done, in, you know, within your world, um, that you can kind of speak to? Yeah, no, there's a couple things that we do. Number one is like reaching out to the client and letting them know that like, how much we appreciate that review because sometimes they write it and you know they don't expect anything in return but then they feel a lot better about that once we tell them how much that means to us and then you know hopefully that now leads to a referral or maybe they you know leave a five-star review for another local business so there's only good things that can come from thanking them from that um, and like you said social media is a big thing these days so we're always trying to leverage you know our organic social content and taking advantage of just, you know, free eyes on, on us and our brand. So anytime we get a review, um, you know, we'll try to post that on our story or even our feed sometimes just so that other people can, can see what people are saying about us. Um, and it's just building, like you said, our reputation, um, our website as well. So we've got, um, a couple of our five star reviews that, that show up on our website so people can kind of see, you know, some of the work that we've done, uh, where I think we're, we're looking at adding a feature, a little plug for a nice job that we're at the bottom of the page. It can kind of show that, you know, this person just left a five-star review. This person just left a five-star review for you. I'm um, just kind of continuing to affirm to them that we're a, a positive brand that people are, you know, enjoying their experiences with. Um, we're also looking at adding another feature where like we send out a box of cookies or something to someone who leaves us a five-star review. And then that kind of asks them, you know, if you, if you really loved your, the work that we did, we'd love to help out your neighbor or your family or friend and just kind of get a referral that way too. So we're always looking at new opportunities and new ways to, to not stop at that review, but how can we take advantage, like you said, of, of that review we got and leverage it as much as possible into, you know, turning that into potentially more work for us. And has it has 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 anything that you've received from a positivity perspective, actually, you that you've actually changed on your business and how it operates? Um, I think the biggest thing is just, and I'd like to track it more, but like, I definitely feel like we get some referrals that come in from um, from contacting people. So we just have that person in place. It's kind of like a customer service representative, so that you know, jobs are finished or reviews are written. They're the ones reaching out. And so 
um, when it is a five star review and they're thanking him for that, a lot of times that does, you know, build our rapport with that customer and turns into a referral. So I don't have like an exact way to see what that's done exactly, but we definitely know that that has kind of increased um, customer referrals for us. Yeah. Cool. Brandon, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you might do certain things on for one customer and they love it and another customer might not love it as much. Um, how do you get, when, when you get positive feedback, positive reviews, how does that change or Im implement or, sorry, change or affect your work in the next job? Um, that's a really interesting question. I, I have to be honest and say that we have, I don't think we've necessarily like systematically looked at positive feedback and like, um, had that shape, um, necessarily like a particular, um, system in our business or process. Um, but what I can say is like, we really just, uh, I, I think for us, um, we really try to just double down on the, um, relational aspect of running a business and community. So if there's anything that I would say is, we uh we try to take the trans transactional aspect out of the um like working with our clients and we try to um bring a relational um approach to it and a community driven approach um to how we work with our customers and how we're you know maintaining those positive interactions and um you know and i say that because we um we try to really like, we don't just want to serve a customer and get a five-star review and that be it. We try to maintain a relationship with them so that, um, you know, it's, it's like staying top of mind with them. And, um, so I think it's, it's less of like, how do we look at that five-star review and like doing something down the road? And it's like, Oh, well, this is a really happy customer. How do we stay connected to them? How do we build a relationship with them? How do we continue to grow community with them and, and like bring them into our family and say, Hey, like you really enjoyed this service that we offered. Well, how can we continue to be involved in, in your life, not just as a customer, but as like part of our community that we live in. And so like we do things like thank you cards um, that we'll hand write to customers and we'll randomly like send a customer, um, a gift card, you know, just because it's like, oh, like I'll look through, um, you know, like I'll have customers who are interacting with us on like our newsletter or on Facebook. And, and I'm just like, man, I really love that customer. I'm going to send them a gift card to Starbucks, like, and I'll get feedback like, wow, like I just randomly got this gift card. And, and we just say like, Hey, we really appreciate you. And, um, some of those clients, um, become, you know, just lifelong clients where we're, providing service for them over and over again. They're referring us. They're getting involved like on our social media. Um, they're referring us like crazy. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, um, I think we just really try to capitalize on relationships. Yeah. I think what's similar for both of your industries or categories and home services is that a lot of your customers can be repeat customers. It's not just, you know, one customer and you do them and then you never see them again. It's repeat business. Right. So that review is also kind of like a referral for themselves because then mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I want to keep coming back because, you know, I, they did a good job. I left a good review. And then they also followed up with me and thanked me for my review and that makes them feel good. So yeah. that relationship aspect is really important. We're coming to the end. Um, uh, we would we do want to stop and, and and maybe pause for a second and and see if you guys have any advice for anyone that's listening out there that is thinking about starting a home service business is you know has already started one and now they're at the point where they say you know what I, I really want to try to grow this thing. Any advice? We will start with you, Dal. A couple things come to mind. I'll I'll share something that I've been trying to do a lot of recently that I've. I mean, I wish I would have started earlier, but it's just surrounding yourself with like with good people and great people that are like minded to you and either are where you're at or, or higher than you. Um, that could be people in your personal life. That could be a coach. That could be employees. I know I'll touch on employees for a second because I know that's a hard thing for people to do when they're starting a business. Is it's so hard to like to make that first hire, or that second hire, because they're nervous that it's not going to be up to the standard that they want to do. But like. Be humble enough to know that like you can't do everything perfect on your own and 
you can find people that you think sometimes you think that you're the best at everything in your business because you've been you know the one that's running it or been researching how to start it but like there's other people that are specialized in in certain things in the business so like I recognize that there's technicians that can clean a pool better than me. Um, there's people that have, you know, better customer service than I might because that can be their main focus. There's people that are better than marketing uh, than I am, even though like that's what I love. So that's been the most recent thing for me is like letting go of that and giving that to someone who who really specializes in that. Um, and obviously it's just one step at a time there. Um, but just surrounding yourself with a team and empowering your team to do the best at what they do is really just huge for, for growing a business. Um, and like I said, just outside of employees too, whether that's like a coach, a bookkeeper, you know, a finance person, you, your friends, your family, just surround yourself with, with like-minded people. And it's just huge for, for growth individually and, and as a business owner. And if, if you don't mind me saying one more thing that, that kind of came to mind at the beginning of the podcast when Brandon was talking and just touching on like the stresses and, and anxiety that comes along with, with running a business and just truly really trying to like enjoy the day to day and enjoy the process is just really try to define what success is for you because I think success is so different for everybody and especially with social media and people like glamorizing, you know, starting a business and entrepreneurship, it can be so easy to like compare yourself to, to what other people are doing. Um, and so really just like figure out what your why is, figure out what your goals are. And then, and then just, just focus on that and don't worry about like what anyone else is doing, what their business is like, what, you know, what they think about you and, and what you're doing. Um, because success from, for me is totally different than success for Brandon. Um, and success for, you know, a brand new business owner, it's getting that first sale. And so for me, if I got one sale today, like that's not a great day for me, but for that person, like that's awesome. So they shouldn't look at me and, and I shouldn't be looking at, you know, Brandon, who's, you know, a couple of years ahead of me in business and, and feel bad about myself because he's seeing, mm -hmm. you know, more business than me. So everyone's just on their own journey and just figure out what that is for you. And, and don't worry about all the outside noise. That's really good. Yeah, that's a uh, good stuff. I wrote down three things. Um, first thing um, would be starting with the end in mind. And uh, so when you start a business, really understand that, um, you know, w why are you getting into it? What do you want to accomplish through it? Um, like for me, um, I have two exit strategies with my business. And one is either to hand it off to my son or two to build a business that can sell. Um, having that in mind, like, okay, I want to either build a business that's going to create generational wealth for my family, um, or I want to be able to sell this to create generational wealth. So building a business that sells. Um, and that leads me into my second point, which is creating reoccurring revenue through your business. So um, if you uh, can somehow think of a way in your business to create reoccurring revenue, you're going to increase its value. Um, if you ever decide to sell. So like for me with painting, I came up with a service contract um, where we're able to get now reoccurring revenue. Um, that's increasing the value of our business, um, but it's also keeping us top of mind with all of our clients. So we're not like serving one client and then never seeing them again for 10 years. Now we're seeing them multiple times a year. Um, mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, I think the greatest form of marketing that you can focus on, especially when you're, which is foundational, like when you're starting your business and then just for its long-term health is really focusing on relationships and community. So um, really uh, focus on networking, um, get around other business owners in your community, build a strong referral group, um, get involved in community, give back, um, support your local, you know, sports teams, uh, get involved with local nonprofits, um, get your face out there, become known as a, you know, leader in your community and people are going to want to do business with you. But I do like the reoccurring revenue model. I think that's, that's, that's a really cool yeah. piece of advice. Yeah. That's huge for us as well. If you're listening out there, that's some valuable advice <laughs> to growing your business. <laughs> yes. yes thank you both so much for your insights um you guys are both amazing at what you do your customer service is amazing your reviews are amazing so it was great to see your insight as to how you got there um before we get log off I, we always ask where can people find you um in person and online yeah so uh you can check us out on any of our social medias flamingo pools um our website is azflamingopools.com if you are in the Arizona area and are looking for pool service but if you're just kind of looking to see what we do check us out on uh yeah on social media at flamingo pools um 
my personal is, is Dallin Huso, just my name. And I, I'm always open for a chat as well. Like I said, like surrounding yourself with people that are where you are or where you want to be. Like, I love talking to people that are in similar places to me or, or a little ahead or a little behind me. And I love, you know, hearing what they're doing, what works for them and talking about what, what's worked for me. So I'd be more than happy to have a chat with anyone that's uh, in the process of growing their business and just, yeah, talk and shop with them. Their website is really pretty too. So go check it out. <laughs> go look at it. Brandon, where can people find you? Um, so you can find me on all forms of social media. I tend to hang out on Instagram a lot um, on my personal, uh, which is just Brandon Sewell. That's a uh, first name, last name. Um, I'm sure you can, in the show notes, find how to spell that. It is kind of a unique spelling. Um, and then our business is Seal Pro Painting. Um, and then I also have my podcast. Um, it's Off the Ladder Podcast. Um, that's on YouTube, uh, Apple, Spotify, any other major podcast platform. And um, that's just uh, Off the Ladder Podcast is um, really just all about helping home service business owners um, get off the ladder. Um, you know, go from being a technician to working on their business instead of in it. So uh, that's my jam. That's what I love. Uh talking about and so yeah that's how you can connect with me amazing thank you both thanks guys yeah thank you so much for having us yeah thank you so much it was a lot of fun and that wraps up today's episode thank you so much for listening as always don't forget to like comment and subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media at built by me podcast if you're listening on apple podcast or spotify and you're feeling extra generous please leave us a five-star rating until next time keep building